give you some sort of setup to uh, ease you into the talk that's going on here today. Uh, for, like many of you actually probably, for the past several years we've been dealing with changes in the industry, okay? And uh, you can sort of look at the architecture books that were written say 20 years ago and their view was uh, cemented in this idea that you had uh, architects that would figure out things early on in the project and they would set things up for the uh, implementation team to uh, come along later and get it all squared away. Generally speaking, that's not how we build software today. So what I've been working on personally for the last couple years, I do not speak for my employer, uh, is uh, trying to figure out ways of uh, doing software architecture or uh, activities that we would recognize as software architects in a slightly different context, in a context where code is a far more central uh, repository of the ideas, and that as we um, decide how we're going to proceed through building the system, it ends up coming back again through the code, okay? So if you use that as the overarching theme uh, for what we're gonna be chatting about here today, I think it'll uh, give each one of these individual ideas more context. And by the end of the talk, we're gonna hit that particular point uh, much more uh, specifically. <clears throat> so what we are going to chat about here today uh, is these particular five topics, okay? And I th what I've been doing, and I think what many of you have been doing on IT uh, systems, is that we've been mixing together uh, ideas from the Agile programming community, uh, ideas from domain-driven design by which we uh, incorporate the concepts from the problem domain into the source code that we're writing, uh, ideas from functional programming because m most mainstream languages have uh, been pulling in more and more functional programming ideas. Uh, and then of course, here we are at Saturn, so software architecture, where this is a, a dear uh, topic to us. And I think most would find that these things are hard to combine. Uh, so what I'd like to do is to, in the, in the same way that you might read a novel and then try to deconstruct it to figure out how it works, uh, we're gonna do a bit of a deconstruction of these ideas so that we can understand how we can fit them to better together, uh, which things, uh, we'll, we'll put things into a better light by which you can recombine these ideas in ways that work well, okay? So I'm not suggesting these are the only five ideas, but these are definitely ones uh, that I found interesting and relevant, so I'm, I'm gonna try to draw our attention to these. Okay, so the talk is gonna proceed with five major sections with big red slides that look like this. Okay, so <laughs> if there's any question, uh, you're gonna see big red slides. First one, control systems. Uh, and of course, we had a great keynote yesterday. You guys all saw the keynote yesterday, right? And uh, what uh, Phil Koopman was talking about was uh, control systems in cars to keep them on the road, okay? So we're gonna chat about that, except my sophistication in chatting about control systems will be much lower because we're not actually driving cars. We're just trying to steer teams in one direction or another. So, uh, the, the very basics of control theory would involve two major styles of doing this. <clears throat> and in fact, these were the <clears throat> excuse me, same metaphors used by the Agile uh, folks maybe 20 years ago when they were talking about how we could change our processes. So on the left, we have open loop control, and that's supposed to be a, a picture of a cannon. And the idea is if you're not hitting the thing you want with the cannon, you get very precise in the way that you aim the cannon. And as we all know, the farther away you are from the target, the more precisely and how you have to have a much better understanding in order to hit what you want to hit. Okay, and they said, you don't want to do that. What you want is the cruise missile, which is over here on the right. And the cruise missile says, I'm gonna go basically towards my target, and then if I find out I'm off course a little bit, I just keep making small adjustments as I go along. And it also has the uh, advantage that if the requirements change as I go along, hey, I can hit that target too. I, I can be adaptive, right? So when, when you hear this uh, juxtaposition of ideas, it makes you feel like, oh, we're doing this horribly wrong if we're, we're doing canon stuff. And so I'd like to dig into this a little bit more deeply so that we can <clears throat> uh, figure out in times when the canon may be what we really wanna do. So here's some examples that I see in software. And so I'm gonna build this slide up as we go. In terms of requirements in the problem domain, if you think about what an open loop kind of solution might be, is that you analyze the problem and come to an understanding of what your problem domain is before you start coding, okay? And compare that with that you uh, do a f the first thing in the first week, you like get your first use case and you build something and then you get another use case and you're like, oh, okay, I guess I misunderstood that and you're like the cruise missile adapting, okay? 
So those are the two different models. Make sense? We're gonna see a bunch more that sort of follow that same pattern. So next when it comes to architecture, <clears throat> you can imagine choosing your architecture to achieve your desired quality attributes, okay? And you do this by figuring out what your desired quality attributes are and then choosing the architecture, which is like sort of obvious, but you can't do it until you've collected all those things. As opposed to, imagine if you say, hey, I'm building an IT system, what's your first guess? I'm gonna make a three-tier system and I'm gonna have a relational database and I'm gonna have some business logic and, you know, well, then we'll change it from there, okay, if it turns out that doesn't work. How about design? Well, certainly there's a, a well-understood idea that you would say, figure out what the state space is of your design, figure out for each one of those different states how you need to handle it, and then you write the code that does that, okay? And compare that with, let's write the success case today because that's the one that's gonna make us money, and if the system crashes, well, I write another story that uh, figures out how I'm going to uh, handle that case. And if it turns out the other possible state spaces that cause trouble we never really get into, well then great, I didn't have to write the code for that, okay? Another one, uh, when I am about to write some code into the computer, one way of doing this is that you could actually study the code that exists, and when you have confidence that you know exactly what code needs to be written next, that is when you type it in, okay? And compare that with some sort of cycle of coding things, oops, the test failed, I, I gotta fix that over here, and then you just repeat until the test pass, okay? That's sort of like adapting yourself, and uh, we've probably both in, been in both modes at different times. And the last one is imagine, say, what process should your team be following? The open loop says we read the books on software process and we go, mm, this is a good process for us and we execute that process. Uh, as opposed to you say, I'm gonna bootstrap myself with almost no process and I'm gonna use uh, some periodic feedback that says, hey, what isn't really working? Let's change the process around this, maybe add things to it so it grows up to support the activities that we need to do, okay? So I hope that I've done what I set out to do, which is, I'm not trying to demonize either of these two things. I'm merely trying to point out the differences, and in fact, I think when you hear this stuff, you sort of, you're like, well, for example, on state space analysis, like, who wouldn't want to do that? And then you say, well, yeah, but sometimes we really do this, don't we? Okay, so not trying to demonize it, just trying to like put it in clear light so that we can understand and choose. So I have two major points that I want to make as reflecting on that. I think many of us here at this conference uh, that would consider ourselves architects or interested in architecture uh, have a tendency to underestimate how effective it is to tweak things at the edges and then cause deep changes to the middle of what's going on. Okay, so the example I'm gonna use here is let's imagine you're having trouble uh, getting your code into production because when you have this binary that you've just compiled, uh, somebody's coming along and saying, no, 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 wait, I've got this extra patch that needs to go in, and you need to put this patch into the code, okay? Uh, sometimes people call this cherry picking, okay? You need to check, cherry pick a bug fix into the binary. And you say, look, I don't wanna do that. So imagine you just said, we're gonna stop. We're not gonna allow any cherry picks. Just like, be very strict about it. Well, what I've seen is patterns that go like this. You say, I'm not gonna patch it, therefore people start being more careful about the code reviews, therefore I end up having fewer bugs in, in, introduced in the system, therefore I have to think harder about my uh, introduction of features, and then really there's really not that much reason no one's asking me to patch anymore because the things are just, I've oiled the machine and I've got it uh, pointed at production, it works out pretty well. So well, I guess what I'm trying to say here is that you will find people in the Agile community sh shouting Yagni, you ain't gonna need it, um, and saying that these feedback mechanisms are all you really need in order to get this, this machine oiled and working and you can actually drive deep change into the machine. So they say don't underappreciate, uh, don't, uh, you should be, uh, you should look for opportunities by which you can use these feedback loops to drive deep change. You don't need to say do it in step zero of your process, okay, and I agree. So, the counterpoint to that is that don't underestimate the amount of friction that you're going to have when you try to change things that already exist, okay? So, the classic way we used to think about this is if you had a waterfall process 
Uh, if you catch bugs earlier, every stage you go along, it's 10 times more ex expensive to fix it there. So if you catch a bug in analysis, great. If it makes its way to coding, well, that's 10 times harder to fix that bug, right? And, and so forth as you go along. So the, the modern refrain here is that we actually use refactoring all the time, right? If we, it's okay, just get something working. And if it isn't quite right, we use refactoring to, to build that back in. It's a reaction uh, to this. So my uh, observation here is that in practice, this becomes pretty difficult. Uh, so for example, if you've written some source code, it's a non-zero effort to go through and change it, even if I, practically speaking, can type some source code, okay? But some source code is harder to change than others. Have you guys had the experience where, for example, like every program that you run has to have a user that runs it, okay? So you're running this thing in the cloud and you decide that here's the user that runs this job and you decide that user is poorly named, okay? Because, for example, your team has split their software into two and now you've got the same user running the same program or say one user running two different programs. You're like, no, 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 I need to separate the permissions. Mechanically going through and making that change can be very expensive. And so to the point where you say, I'm just not even gonna deal with it. And so when the newcomer comes on your team and says, why is the foo user running the bar program? You're like, well, it turns out the team used to be the foo team, but now we're the bar team. And like, it was a real pain in the butt to change all the scripts, to change the user and da 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 da, okay. So the second thing is that, that developers get used to, um, uh, they have a mental map of the source code in their heads, right? And if you go changing it, there's a non-zero cost to doing that, okay? So, like, you have to justify this feedback in terms of the feedback loop. Do I really want to change it or I want to leave it as people already know it? And then finally, it comes to persistent data structures. You know, like, yes, uh, if you've got a column in the database that's called foo and you really want to change it to bar, you can do that, but you probably have to do an expensive and annoying um, upgrade procedure to get uh, that data changed on disk. So. My observation here is that even with feedback loops and refactoring, complexity tends to build up in the system. So you can win big if you can get it closer to right the first time. Because it's a lot easier to get it mostly right and then make a small tweak than it is to say, here's something that could possibly work and then you have to do, and you're leaning very heavily on the feedback loops to change it, okay? And so in the same way that the Agilist might say, uh, you ain't gonna need it, let's just get started. You might have the architects running around saying, stop the presses, don't you dare do this before we've thought through the quality attribute scenarios, okay? And so, if you sort of think of these two as juxtaposed against each other, on the one hand, I would say to the architects, uh, you would be surprised at how well these feedback loops work, and to the agilist, I would say, um, you would be surprised how well you can build software and how few changes you have to make if you think just a little bit more early on or you develop the kind of expertise needed to just hit the target the first time. So this is a terrible caricature, um, but it's meant to sort of draw out those two distinctions. So on the left-hand side, we've got the architects, like the people that come to this conference. And the thinking is that there's one person with a complete enough mental model, let's call that person the architect, to reason through the qualities that I want in the system or the outcomes I want in the system. And uh, we need to do that reasoning, so we, we're gonna call it iteration zero. <laughs> but that's really just a way of uh, making this work like a waterfall, is just pull all that reasoning up to the front. And in that sort of style of, uh, of work, you're doing a lot of predicting of what the system is gonna need and how it should behave, and it relies upon open loop control, okay? Does everybody get that? Okay, so because so, that's, that's sort of like, a lot of the talk is, is resting upon this. It's not that we exclusively use open loop control. It's that I've noticed that the architecture community, when there's an option, we tend towards the open loop control. That's why I call this a caricature, right? But just like, you know, we tend towards that side. Like, why don't we just nail that down now, rather than like waiting until it's wrong and then fixing it? Okay, that's sort of the, our, our approach to things. As opposed to, uh, the, the trend that has been moving through industry, uh, which is that we delay making decisions, we devolve decisions uh, out from a central authority to uh, a lot of different people can make those decisions, and they say, well, I don't have an analytical framework for this, but in general, it seems to work out. Like, I build systems, and I make adap adaptations, and it works out. There's a lot of reacting going on, and it relies upon uh, closed loop control, the feedback loops, okay? Make sense? So, uh, the thing that's going on here that I notice is that both sides tend to dismiss the kind of control that the other would be 
is comfortable in using, okay? Now, the purpose of this talk, again, is to deconstruct what's going on, to like shed light on what I think the factors are, and I don't think any of us wanna just dismiss one side or the other. We wanna understand and not just say, ah, the, this famous person says this process works really great and their experience bears it out. Okay, I would really like to understand what's going on. So the question is, should we use open loop or closed loop control? And the answer, I think, is you gotta use both. Um, we're gonna be in better shape if we understand where we're using each one of these different kinds of uh, control. Uh, and we want to avoid the knee-jerk reflexes. You probably have heard people on your team say both of these kinds of things at different times, okay? So, uh, first conclusion here is that I think we could, should use open loop control when we can afford to do that, okay? Uh, my experience has been that the pattern catalogs for IT systems specifically are fantastic, right? I mean, you've got Fowler's Enterprise Application Patterns, you've got the Gregor Hopi Catalog of Patterns, You've got the works from the SEI, including the documenting software architectures, which has very good coverage for IT kinds of systems. You've got the patterns of software architecture books. Like if you just read those books and you said, I could only use the patterns in here, you could probably solve almost all of your IT system challenges, right? Choosing between the patterns is still hard, but the point is the, the menu is in front of you, okay? It's just, it's up to you to put them together. The next observation, and, and I hinted at this before, refactoring is easy when it's 90% right to begin with, right? If you come in and you say, look, uh, my, my server gets messages. I'm gonna parse those messages and validate them before I keep going. I know there's not a user story that says to do that, but I'm gonna do that now and I'm gonna get failure handling right because I don't know of any IT system that doesn't need to do failure handling, okay? And then finally, uh, when it comes to certain things, uh, not all requirements are equal. Okay, so when we say we're gonna respond to requirements changing, that's absolutely right. But in our community, we know that there are architecturally significant requirements. If we could figure out a few of those and get the architectural styles right at the beginning, we're gonna put ourselves in a really good position to actually react uh, to the other kinds of changes that are coming down. So if you say the discount for gold, gold star customers goes from 10% to 15%, no problem, okay? If you say, I'd like to have a single page application versus a server rendered application, well that's more disruptive and so I'd like to figure out that requirement earlier rather than later. The second thing um, is that we should invest in expertise and this was a, a theme of Joe Yoder's uh, talk that just came before us. Uh, experts are not, um, if you watch an expert in any field, it is not the case that that expert is slower to execute their craft than somebody who's inexperienced. In fact, it's the opposite. Like when you gain expertise, you're fast at it. If somebody's a good woodworker, they're an expert, they're gonna do that job faster than somebody who's not, okay? So if we want to uh, build stuff well, investing in expertise is the obvious thing, rather than relying upon the feedback loop to say, yeah, you made me a door, the door is crooked. Oh, I can fix that. No, <laughs> invest in your skills so you make the door straighter the first time. The second is that we probably need uh, patterns inside of our processes to make sure that expertise is, is highlighted. Rather than reacting, like I would say, let's try to get the expertise high. Uh, and then finally is that make sure your coding standards stay very high, okay? So instead of saying all the tests are green, yes, that's also a good idea. Like, uh, we need to uh, keep each other uh, to high standards of coding excellence to the extent that we can. I should also point out that uh, a reliance on expertise is one of the core tenets, it's one of the core uh, philosophies. They're in the Agile Manifesto, there were pr principles. The principles is one of the 12 principles that they believe in this, right? So, and yet somehow, uh, I asked Joe Yoder in, the, in his talk, say like, why is that not talked about so much? We, we talk a lot about process, but yeah, uh, this, is, this is definitely core part of the Agile community. Okay, part two, the roles on the team. <clears throat> now, this section is the shortest section, and it's the least well fleshed out. I think there's a lot more work to be done here, but it's an important topic. Um, here again are two caricatures of how you might organize your team. Uh, the left one is probably more familiar if you read one of the software architecture books. Uh, you've got a single technical leader, um, and you've got reasoning through an architecture that has to happen in one mind, okay? It's not that three of us collaborate and each one of us has one third of the problem in our head, and if there's something wrong, like 
because we sliced up the problem, we missed some important thing that required two of us to collaborate, but we didn't. We don't want to react to things. We want to get all of that analysis into one mind. Let's abstract it and let's condense it and let's get that architecture model there. And compare that with some form of decentralized control, okay, where things get pushed out. And this one is always trickier for me to articulate. Um, I don't know exactly what it is. People sometimes talk about this as, uh, they rarely talk about it as anarchy. They sometimes talk about it as democracy, like we're all peer developers, we're all full stack developers, we can all do everything all the time. Um, I'm not sure that that's really how things work out in practice. Uh, anarchy is perhaps closer to what goes on sometimes, right? Like in an ideal world, we all point to point communicate with each other and somehow do that reasoning, but it becomes trickier to do, okay? And then finally, uh, some processes rely upon emergence. Uh, so they say, you're not going to do reasoning, right? You're just gonna get in there and you're gonna write some code. It's sort of like you go to the job site, start cutting down some trees and say, what are we building? And the answer is a house. Okay, <laughs> we're gonna build a house. And like, there's not, you just say, look, it's gonna work out. It's gonna work out. And, and oftentimes it does. So uh, one of the aspects that I've found very challenging on uh, teams that don't have the central leadership and they, they rely upon peer-to-peer -peer, uh, communication is this idea of social proof. Uh, how many of you are familiar with this book uh, called Influence from 1984? Okay, this is a fantastic book. His stories are great. The, the writing of it is, is, is just spot on. And it's all these uh, psychological studies that were done that are <laughs> replicable. Um, they have one, for example, where uh, they, they bring people in for a psych study. Okay, they're sitting in the waiting room. Little do they know the study has already you know, commenced. They're, <laughs> they're sitting there and uh, the, uh, somebody who's in on the game comes in with a, a Coca-Cola and says, hey, I was at the soda machine, I thought you might want one too. Here you go, uh, da, 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 da. small talk, small talk. Uh, and then say, you know, my Boy Scout troop is doing a fundraiser, would you like to buy some tickets? Okay, it turns out if the guy hadn't brought a Coke, they were very unlikely to buy the Boy Scout fundraiser thing, but because you gave them a Coke, they feel socially obligated, and like the, the, the ticket scale, uh, sale skyrocketed. Okay, uh, have you guys ever gotten in the mail uh, like an envelope that has like return address stickers or something on it? It's trying to use the same technique. They've given you a gift. Well, why don't you just sign $5 over to my charitable organization? Okay, uh, so this idea of social proof is uh, the thing that when people don't know, it's one of the ideas from the book, when people don't know how to behave, they look at the other people, how they're behaving, and they do what that person does. Okay, so what I found is on these teams where we're sort of uh, figuring out the social dynamics on the fly, and we're not sure if we're in anarchy mode or democracy mode or central leader mode, like these things are sort of in flux, okay? That the social proof becomes very important. So if you come in and say, I think we need to do architectural reasoning, and everybody's like, nah, I'm not so sure. There's like whispers behind your back that like this guy's been reading these crazy architecture books and that's all old fashioned stuff that can be really undermining to what's going on. As opposed to if you have this first mate pattern, like if we all know how the first mate works on the ship, at least from the movies, as far as I can tell, the captain says, let's sail to that other island. And the first mate goes, you heard the captain, let's get those sails rigged up, and, you know? And just having that level of social proof of like, okay, this is what we're doing, uh, that seems to work out pretty well. At least I've had success with that pattern. So I just wanted to share that for you. Um, and so the question we've got about uh, going from our old thinking where we always have a single architect who's got the big idea in their head uh, is we have another question. What if we had two people trying to do the reasoning or three people trying to do the reasoning and they're collaborating or even zero? And so my deconstruction of this is that we need to preserve three aspects that that central person had. First is that uh, you want the ability for one mind to reason about the core structures, okay? And what I mean by that is, uh, imagine you had somebody in the previous uh, breakout session had a two million line program that they were dealing with, okay? If there's no abstractions in that program, I'm gonna say none of us here are gonna be able to swap two million lines of code into our head and to be able to do the reasoning, right? Okay, imagine if we followed the advice that's pretty standard in our community, right? Which is that there's a, a, a stack of abstractions and I could think about them as being independent services and they're doing uh, small jobs and that uh, uh, I could 
think about those abstractions rather than thinking about individual lines of code. Hmm, well, maybe I can swap two million lines of code into my head if I don't really have to think about every single line of code. That's what I'm getting at. So that's that first idea. The second one is that there are essential structures for reasoning. So for example, in our community, we call them like modules and components and allocation elements and connectors and, and so forth, right? We have this vocabulary. I'm not saying that's the only vocabulary of abstractions, okay? You could come up with other ones, um, but you must have some vocabulary of abstractions that the, the team is agreeing to work with because if you don't have that, uh, it, it's gonna be difficult to add up uh, and, and reason about things. And then finally, is that once you've figured out things, you need to have some mechanism by which you can have influence on what goes on. And that influence could take different forms. The traditional influence that we're used to is, I've asked you to build this module, or I've asked this module not depend on that module, or something like that, okay? But there's other ways of doing it. Here's a few. Um, you can imagine that like you could have many people responsible for doing the reasoning, right? Like that we could sort of swap off, like even think about I'm on vacation, you become the architect next week, right? Or uh, everyone is empowered to do this reasoning and propose different ideas, right? No central architect. Uh, and the second is imagine if you, instead of saying, uh, here is my architecture document, kablam, you were doing this influence in code reviews, okay? So every time somebody sends you code, you're saying, hey, I like what you're doing here, but notice that you're depending this module on that module, and I think we probably don't want to do that because we have these problems. And they go, ah, I got it. So there's different ways that you can still preserve these ideas, um, but I think you do want to preserve those things. And as you innovate, watch out that you haven't accidentally broken one of these things. Uh, here's just an example. Imagine we've got a project, we divide it into two parts, okay? It's my part and your part. If we are both allowed to independently modify our things and literally do not coordinate in any way, well, I've broken almost all of these things. I have no way to influence what's going on in that other project. I can't reason through what's going on short of reading every line of code and so forth. So yeah, that would be the challenge. I'm not su suggesting that everyone says to do that. I'm just saying watch out that that doesn't accidentally emerge, that you, you lose the ability to have architectural control. So speaking of control, Part three is about this idea of uh, intellectual control. Now, who is familiar with this term, intellectual control? Okay, so in the early days of software, uh, there was this guy, Edsger Dijkstra, and uh, he was famous for writing these papers saying we should write uh, proofs about our programs, we should aspire to be mathematicians, and was generally disdainful of the state of the practice. He, in other words, he was a modern day software architect, okay, except but even more mathematical. And uh, so he would always say, beware, as your programs get big and complicated, you're going to lose intellectual control. He would say things like, we need to be humble in our intellectual abilities and realize when things are getting out of our control, okay? So there was a great talk uh, a couple years ago by Rich Hickey, and he was talking about what does it mean to have things under control? And he was saying, imagine you were driving your car down this highway, and as you drive the car down the highway, you can see there's guardrails on either side. Imagine your car hit the guardrails a couple times on your way to the destination. Would you say, I got to the store under control? You say, well, no, I mean, the, 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 I, I, I didn't say it specifically, but yeah, you, you got to the destination, but you weren't supposed to be hitting the guardrails. That sort of indicates some kind of lack of control that, that I'm not really terribly happy with, okay? And so the reason he was bringing this up is if you think about some of the activities we do as software developers, it has that flavor, okay? It's like we're getting the job done, but but if we were doing the job in a way that we had intellectual control, we wouldn't be hitting those guardrails, okay? So, did I get that right? Yeah. So here's a picture of a, of a guy playing whack-a-mole, okay? And this literally, I've seen this pattern happen at work, that you change some code, you have a plausible idea that this is reasonable change, you run the test and you say, oops, I broke some code somewhere else, for example. Well, of course, 
you go over and you fix that and you run the test again and that breaks something else. But eventually this calms down, you're not breaking any more tests, and then you declare success. Yay, the program works, right? Because it passes the test. Do you have that program under control? And you were all laughing because actually that's, that resembles modern software development to an enormous degree, right? Okay? And I would say, yes, this is actually a kind of control. But it's not intellectual control. It's not that sort of open loop control that we're going for. Like, one way of thinking about open loop is like you're, you're playing darts, you know? And you're like, mm, be really careful, mm, ding, you know, like I'm gonna hit that and I'm not gonna hit the guardrails, okay? There's a different kind of control. Imagine you play darts, but you had a tube between you and there, and it just bounced off the tube until it hit the dartboard, okay? Yeah, it's, but somehow it indicates that like somehow, like me over here without that tube, I'm not gonna do it. Somebody else might say, the tube is really good. You want the tube, look, you hit the dartboard. And I would say, absolutely, I would absolutely agree. But Dijkstra would come back and he'd say, you don't really have intellectual control over that thing, right? That's a different kind of control that you're exerting over it. So, uh, let me suggest that that second kind of control is a kind of statistical control. Unless you are the kinds of people that actually wrote exhaustive test cases for your program, which you can't, right? Then that means that you have a, some statistical coverage of the behavior of the program. And if your tests all pass, that means you have a statistical likelihood that the program is actually behaving correctly, right? I mean, yeah, right? So, as opposed to the intellectual control, you're trying to say, get it just right, hit the target, got it. Statistical control, it's working. This is definitely valuable stuff. We're engineers, we're trying to get stuff out the door. This is good. So I'm gonna suggest that intellectual control is a bit, it, it's gotten a bad rap in recent years because this uh, feedback loops and closed loop control works really, really well. We can get a lot of stuff out the door. But there are problems with it. Like if I look at the code that can, that can build up over time, and as we talked about, the friction um, of, of getting the code super clean, is if I wrote some not awesome code and then I found some edge cases and I just sort of patch over them, you're gonna find edge cases not being handled so great in the code. Um, your mental model of the code can be more complicated than it would be if I had thought through, if I had a little more time to think through it. The total code base is probably bigger than it would be otherwise, okay? Um, you're gonna be able to refactor the code faster if you have it under control. Uh, your deployments are probably gonna work smoothly and easily rather than saying like I tried to push to production, it did something weird, okay, well let's, let's, let's work and react, okay? And the last thing is that there's a certain kind of joy that comes from when things are under your intellectual control. And do, do you guys, do you, do you know what I'm getting at here? Because I, I'm having a hard time saying it, but I think that everybody who comes to this conference would like things to be neatly organized, okay? Maybe not in everything in our life, but when it comes to the machines that we're building, we're like, I would like to understand what this is doing. I do not like the idea that it just seems to be working, right? Like, that's not something that makes us feel comfortable in our gut, okay? Especially when, you know, we're signing on the line saying, here, company, I built you this lovely thing. <laughs> We're like, I'd like to really believe that that's a lovely thing, okay? So how do you regain intellectual control? Let's imagine you're on a project, okay? And you're working on some code, and you're like, I'm gonna achieve intellectual control. George told me about this, and I think he's right, okay? Your temptation is to start with the code that you're writing, and I think that's gonna be a problem, because guess what? Your code depends on some other code. And if that other code doesn't really make any sense, it isn't really under the same kind of control that you're looking for, well then you're gonna sort of have to get that under some amount of control, if only at the interface to that code to say like, well like when are you gonna throw an exception? Well you have to you know, be more fussy perhaps than that code was already. And so I think you're gonna have a hard time with that because the, it, unless you've convinced everybody around you that they want you, you want them to rise up to your standards, it's gonna be hard. On the other hand, if you start at the bottom, and like chip away at the bottom and get all that code super clean and you march your way up, that can work out okay, right? Because the code at the bottom has no dependencies, now you can step up one level. You get that stuff cleaned up, maybe the code at the bottom is changing less rapidly than the rest of your code base, okay? Finally, uh, how do you know when you've actually got stuff under control? Well, that's a hard thing to say because the intellectual control by its nature is something that's in your mind, right? So like Phil Koopman's talk yesterday was fantastic. If you drove your car a million miles and you haven't hit a kangaroo yet, do you really have it under control, right? So it's like it becomes a statistical problem of, of determining whether you have evidence of control. 
So here's some stuff that I would say are good signals that you've got it. You've got a small set of types or concepts that programmers can work with flexibly to get the job done. Those types and concepts that you have in your head match the ones that you're finding in the code. Uh, they largely explain the phenomena in the problem. And by that I mean it could either be the problem domain, like customers and accounts, or it could be the problem as in the end tier architecture or whatever architectural style. And finally, uh, that the team can manipulate easily, right? Uh, if you end up with a set of concepts that only one person in your team finds fluent uh, and, and effective, but everybody else is like, I don't know what is going on with his code, uh, then that's, that's not a great sign. Or rather, you might have an individual with control, but the team doesn't have control. Okay, part four. How are we doing on time? Hmm. Good. <sighs> now we get to the long sections of the talk with lots of slides. Um, uh, those of you who've been following my work the last couple years, I've given some talks at Saturn about uh, extended and distributed cognition. Some of this stuff is, uh, uh, you, you'll have seen some of the content here before, but hopefully within the context of this presentation it makes more sense, okay? Because as I said, uh, increasingly I'm looking for ways by which we can use the code base itself as a mechanism uh, that, that, that is central to explaining what's going on with the software development, right? And is the, uh, uh, it is the carrier of the ideas. So with that in, in mind, let's talk about uh, these two different kinds of uh, cognition, extended and distributed. So extended cognition is this idea that uh, <clears throat> uh, even if the thinking goes on exclusively in my mind, it is the case that if you give me a pencil and paper, and you allow my thinking to spill out into scribbles that I can put on a piece of paper, I can solve far more complicated problems than if you say I have to do it in my head alone. The simplest example is imagine you've got a couple of numbers and you say, can you add them in your head versus if I give you a pencil and paper, in which case you can do an arbitrarily large uh, program. So that same thing, I think, is exactly what's going on with computer programming because I don't think very many people in here can write bigger than a 10-line program in their head, but we deal with these massive code bases, right? So there's this cognitive phenomenon that our, our, our mind in doing its thinking is referencing the things that are outside of it, the things that we're seeing in front of us, right? And that would include the source code that we've got. But then that requires that external representation, in this case the source code or this, this diagram over here, shows some numbers that I'm trying to add up, but that representation stinks because I use a proportionally spaced font, so the columns went away, right? So it's hard for me to add those up, okay? So the idea here is that you want the external representation to be matching your thoughts so that there's this very smooth cognitive loop and you're doing this incredibly complicated activity which is to understand the program as it exists, to map it into the abstractions that you're trying to think about, like these two modules shouldn't depend on each other, and you're gonna make the next edit to that source code that preserves those invariants and uh, makes more features happen in the code. So here's an example of, uh, we're gonna work through this and we'll see some code that I'm not terribly happy with. Uh, imagine you had an intersection and there's uh, two streets and one street has twice the amount of traffic. You build a traffic light. And here's uh, some trivial little source code. It says, set one of them to green, the other one to red, wait 30 seconds, flip the order, wait 15 seconds. Seems like a plausible set of source code that would make this traffic light run. Yeah? Okay. So somebody reads your source code and says, well, why is one of them 15 and the other one 30? Right? And even if they understand why one is twice as big as the other one, because one street is twice as big, right? <clears throat> why is it 15 and 30 and not 40 and 20 or some other multiple of two, okay? And the reason that I'm putting this up here is that the code is a fine solution, but it's a lousy external representation that in order for me to reason through this problem, I have to bring things into it that aren't apparent to me, right? So it's like I'm doing this loop where I'm looking at the source code and I'm thinking about the problem, but I actually have to use my long-term memory about the requirements to, to bring all these things to bear, okay? So there are, there's plenty of uh, computer programs which are fine machines, they do their job right, but maybe the thing that we should be striving for is a higher bar, 
right? We should be looking for external representations that allow me to uh, make this cognitive loop between me and the external representation very effective. And so I think that there's something going on here if you take a look at the history of programming languages. Uh, in the primitive era, we had sort of code as a machine. We were using punch cards and we were toggling bits on a computer, okay? Uh, we had uh, comments, variable names, maybe method names. And then there was a transformation between the 60s and the mid 70s, okay? And three things happened. First was user-defined types where I could say, this is a, a customer account, a customer record, or this is a customer object. The second is in 67 when Simula said, well, wait a second, this program that I'm writing is meant to be a simulation of the world. In that particular case, I think they were doing uh, transportation, right? So you say, instead of building a simulation inside of a computer program, why isn't the computer program the simulation itself, okay? And so that is the foundation of what we do in IT programs, right? So for everything that your customer tells you about, like your customer says, there needs to be A, B, and C. If you go open up my program, and no matter what programming language I write it in, you're gonna find A, B, and C represented as concepts in the program, right? It's a, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the things that the customers are talking about and the programs that you write. And then finally, this idea of abstract data types, uh, that we can separate the idea of the, uh, the interface from the implementation, right? That there's a, an abstract idea of how that thing works, and then behind the covers, there's more mechanics that I need not bother myself with. And with those three key abstractions, we were in great shape to do this internal external loop, okay? That because more of the things that I needed to think about to solve the problem were apparent in front of me as opposed to being in my long-term memory. And so if you look at the modern area where I call this code as my partner in thought, that I have the opportunity with all these language mechanisms, the one on the left and, and the, these ones on the right, to get closer and closer to expressing the way that I want to think about the problem such that I get a super efficient loop that as I think about the program, problem, I'm doing that thing in the source code. And I think all of us here who've been programming will recognize that feeling when it all clicks. And you're like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I could just make this program do what I want. And you also recognize the opposite, which is I have this clear idea in my head, but this program is just, it's not structured in a way that allows me to, to get to there. So here's a terrible question. <clears throat> when you look at the source code around you, what percentage of it is pre-1974, right? Like what percentage of it is taking advantage of the opportunity that's presented to us? And I'm not just saying put more comments in your code or follow a literate programming style. I'm saying something slightly different, which is if we're aware of ourselves as human beings uh, and we do this extended cognition, we need to be aware of the analysis that we've done of the pro problem and get as much of that analysis into the code as we can. We wanna be thinking about the problems at the right level of abstraction. And there's this concept called supervenience, uh, which is that it is difficult to think about the problem when you don't have the, uh, this, the abstraction level right. And in fact, yesterday, you may remember Phil Koopman made sort of an aside comment, he said, He's talking about self-driving cars. He said, your, pers your sensors may pick up that there is a pedestrian at the side of the road. Knowing what's with the position of that pedestrian at a subatomic level, he said, will not help you figure out if that pedestrian is about to cross the road, right? You need to have models working at a different level in order to figure out the intent of that person, okay? And I was like, oh, that's exactly right. Having a higher resolution understanding of something, for example, like that I understand the specific data types that are implementing some concept, does not allow me to reason through what's going on, okay? And so, if you think about this stack of abstractions here, you can imagine if you're like one level off, you can sort of make your brain work harder and sort of do it. You can sort of think about atoms as particles, right? Or you can think about molecules as atoms. But thinking about molecules as particles, like it starts to get almost impossible, right? And then forget about social dynamics as you know, interacting subatomic particles. It's just like you have no leverage on the problem at hand, okay? So you, if you get the abstraction level right, you're, you're actually gonna have leverage on the problem. So related but distinct from the first concept, which is uh, extended cognition, where my own single mind has a smooth loop with the external representation that lets me solve bigger problems, is the idea that we often, as humans, have to split a problem up uh, across a group of people. And it, 
programming has this every single day. I mean, there's very few programs that we write that are worthwhile that a single person can do on their own, okay? So I look at this picture of these guys on the, on the bridge of a ship, and the reason there's so many of them there, there's what, 10 or something, is because if one person could do it, they would. They have, they don't, the, the job is too big for one person to do. So they have to do this really hard thing, which is chop up the, pro the problem across these people. All of them work on subparts, and yet it all assemble into something that works, okay? So notice this computer screen down here at the bottom. Let's just say this guy is using that screen. The first thing we need to do is make sure the external representations that are there on the ship are effective for a single person swapping in and out their problem, okay? Because what's gonna happen is that this guy has to go to sleep at some point and somebody else is gonna come on and replace him. And so we gotta make sure that that representation works for him and it works for the next person. So imagine I wrote some source code, I wrote it myself. It's a great external representation for me, but when Kurt comes in and replaces me and he's gonna edit my code, if he reads this and it's like, I have no idea what George's code is doing, right, because it's not a good representation for him, we've gotta sync up what our external representation is. It's a higher burden than for an individual to do this. So the second thing that's going on is, again, you gotta chop up this program or this, this problem across the people in the team and make all of those guys stitch uh, that bigger cognitive problem together. That's really hard. So in order for this thing to work, three, at least three, prop, three constituent things. First is that they have good theories or models of what it is they're trying to do. In this case, it might be the position of the ship, the velocity of the ship, and the mission or something like that. That might be the abstractions they're using. The second is that they have good external representations. If this is a great representation for figuring out where you are and where you're going, then great. If it's not a very good one, uh, did anyone ever see the original Wrath of Khan movie? I thought I'd have the right group here. Yeah, so like Khan came from the past and he had a like a seafaring ship mentality and he had a two-dimensional map in his head and he's doing tactics better than Kirk. But Kirk had the modern theory in his head and he's like, I'm in a spaceship, I can go up and down. And so like he, he outwits the other guy because he had a more effective external representation for this. And finally, is that the, the, the models need to be compatible across the team. So like no matter how good it is for me, we have to figure out one that works for everybody. So people aren't computers, right? We often fall into this trap because uh, mathematics and so forth are so effective at solving large abstract problems. But there are cases where we can't treat our coworkers or ourselves as theorem provers, right? Like even if that logically speaking should work, we have to watch what actually happens on teams. And I have two uh, things to point out. The first is that we should be leveraging this idea of extended cognition. We wanna get the theories out of our heads so that we have an effective loop between us and those things. Use the language features and use code reviews to make sure that when somebody's writing the next chunk of code and they've done some analysis, they've taken the new chunk of analysis and gotten it into the code. And second is to use distributed cognition. We gotta figure out how to solve the problem across a group of people, not just hope it works out, uh, and we should standardize, in some cases, the external representation, which might be things like the coding standards or the, the architecture. Okay, last section. How many do we want to talk about? Okay. Okay, last section is on theories and convergence. Uh, this is another topic that I've covered in previous talks, but again, hopefully within this context, it's gonna uh, make a bit more sense. So. Uh, here's an example of something that you might be asked to do. Uh, there's a, a platform where there's trains, or it could be an airport, um, and uh, you've got these speakers, loudspeakers, okay? And they can make announcements. I mean, you guys have probably been at the airport where the, the two adjacent gates, they get on and they both announce the flight at the same time, and you can't hear what the other one's doing. So we're gonna write a program to solve that, okay? So what we want is we want those announcements to not overlap with each other, okay? Time to write some code, who's got their code ready? So, imagine if I did this, some trivial implementation. I said the start time for my announcement is the other speaker's end time, okay? So if it doesn't have any speaking, well presumably it would just be now, okay? But if it was in the middle of doing something, you'd say, when are you gonna finish? I will start my stuff when you finish, okay? So then we can schedule my announcement at the, uh, the start time. Make sense? 
I know it's not the best algorithm, but it's like plausible, okay? So somebody comes along and says, guess what? We have three speakers. What would you like to do? We're like, don't worry. I'm a programmer. I'll figure this out. Uh, so what I do is I say, really, there's two other speakers. Get both of their end times and take the, 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 the maximum, the longer of the two, and we're going to do the same sort of trick we did before. OK? Well, actually, if I'm going to have three speakers, I'm probably going to have N speakers, right? I'm a, I'm a software developer. I, I got this. OK, I have N speakers. Plus, I've got a lambda. OK. <laughs> so, uh, so I've got this totally generalized. And notice I've got now a collection of speakers I call speakers. And I've got a mapping function. So I've got this N time. OK. So, then your requirements person comes to you and says, yeah, I think you misunderstood. Not all the speakers are in the same place, right? Not all speakers <laughs> interfere with each other. This speaker is across the, the road. Like there's these two and this one's in the parking lot or something like that. So like this one doesn't interfere with those, right? You, you, could, you could play those announcements at the same time. Does that make sense? And you're like, right, right, right. I overgeneralized the problem too quickly. <laughs> that, that doesn't work like that at all. So, it's not just a collection of speakers. I need something more complicated. In fact, what I need to do is have this idea of distance between the speakers. That's my new theory, is that it's the distance between the speakers that that's the important thing that I need to pay attention to. Okay, you could imagine something slightly different. You might say it's not even the distance. It's something more complicated, because imagine you had something on the first floor and something on the second floor, and the distance between them is 10 feet, but they're not going to interfere. But for my model, it's a two-dimensional Wrath of Khan kind of model, it's okay. So the first thing is I want to make sure that this concept that has just come into my analysis of the problem is showing up in the program, right? And it now is, it's got distance in here. And notice I've got this great variable name, my speakers. My speaker is not a very good variable name, right? Like who's written a variable name that's called my such and such, right? Like everybody, okay? Because you didn't, you just said, ah, it's fine. It's, it's a variable name, okay? No, 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 you really want to get this idea of interference into the code, right? The whole reason for writing the code this way is to avoid interference. And if you notice so far, we haven't expressed that idea in the code yet. So we can get that in there, and that's pretty good. But notice, the distance is less than 20. Well, okay, that's old school. Like, we just need to have some concept. And if you name the concept well, you know, you're like, oh, okay, the safe distance, okay, the interfering speakers, okay, I see what's going on here. We've got a great, great, great. Are we in good shape now? Right, you know. So it turns out, and I tricked you guys all, that the original code works just fine before we make any edits, didn't it? Right? Because the original code was written as if there wasn't a third speaker, and it says, when should I schedule my announcement? And then we changed all the code, and then someone said, actually, the speaker's in the parking lot. You're like, you would have been fine with the original code, right? It would have actually passed the test if you'd just done the dumbest thing, okay? So here's an option. Keep the original code. Put a comment on it that says, the third speaker is really far. You don't need to worry about it. It doesn't interfere, okay? But notice this isn't really ready for the fourth speaker. So like maybe that's not a very good place to leave the code. So the important things to take away from this are I can write Java code. <laughs> <laughs> that other people can see the analysis as we've gone through this, that I've, the, the theory has uh, become visible, and the code is expressing the most generalized version of the theory that we can, right? I mean, we don't want to leave the, just the comment in the code that says something. We're like, no, express the analysis in the code to the extent that we can. I would, be, I would love to do the same thing with an architectural example. It's difficult to get an architectural example that fits on one slide. But I'm not trying to say that this applies only to, like, say, domain problems or non-architectural code. So this idea came from Peter Naur. Uh, the term theory building actually comes from the philosophical literature where they're trying to answer the question, what does it mean to understand something? And before we go off of the deep end of philosophy, <laughs> like what does it mean to understand something, we can just keep it at this. And he said in an in a incredibly provocative statement, programming properly should be regarded as an activity by which the programmers form or achieve a certain kind of insight, a theory of the matters at hand, and that this suggestion is in contrast to what appears to be the more common notion that programming should be regarded as a production of a program in certain other texts. So if you remember that stoplight example, we had some code 
the typing of that code is a program, okay? But what he's saying here is that you should think about programming is more like that second example where we're coming to develop this theory about how things work and that we're creating the program. He's not getting into the point of like how well we can express it in the programming language, but it's the same idea here, is that we're doing theory building. There's also a similar uh, concept going on with Tony Hoare's award, uh, Turing Award talk. And you guys have probably heard this quote uh, before. I loved this quote when I first heard it. I was like, this is the most clever thing ever. There are two ways of constructing a software design. One way is to make it so simple that there are obviously no deficiencies, and the other way is to make it so complicated that there are no obvious deficiencies. Okay, like what a wonderful phrasing of that thing. But what I like even more is the second part of this quote, which says, the first method is far more difficult. It demands the same skill, devotion, insight, and even inspiration as the discovery of the simple physical laws which underlie the complex phenomena of nature. So he's specifically making a connection between the way that we design software programs and what's going on in the physical sciences when we are developing theories of the world, okay? And so let's chat about that. Uh, here's my caricature of how we do theory building in the sciences. Each one of these dots is like a scientist uh, looking at the world and making an observation. And the uh, gray dots are, it's exactly what I expected. <laughs> Look, I can take this and if I let go of it, it gravity still works, okay, checks out. <laughs> But sometimes something really strange happens, and those are the, the special dots. And when that happens, I'm gonna use language from programming. They have to refactor their theory so that that dot no longer is surprising. Make sense? Do you see that sort of wild worldview? And then I even wrote some source code, is the pseudocode that runs inside the, the scientist head. Observe the world. If you're not surprised, do nothing. But if you are surprised, you need to refactor your theory. So over time, you should try to get a convergence, right? Is that in the future, when you get more observations, the theory gets better and better such it's harder and harder surprise me, right? I wanna converge those theories, okay? And basically how well I understand what's going on is proportional to how well I can converge the theory and not be surprised, okay? And I think that feels in many ways like what we're doing when we're programming, right? We're trying to figure out how stuff works you keep throwing me requirements, and some of them are like, no big deal, da, 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 da. Other ones are like, did not see that coming, that's gonna be trouble, okay? So this is what I see us doing when we're programming, is the same sort of thing is going on, the requirements are coming in, and most of them are like, yep, 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 yep. And every once in a while, they're like, hold on a second, that's trouble. So, um, over time, what we're trying to do is we're trying to tune our program so that it's fit to the environment, right? So that it is effective uh, at solving problems in the environment, and if you throw me new problems from that same environment, I'm ready to make small edits to the program, okay? And I love this quote from Kent Beck. Make the change easy, warning, this may be hard, then make the easy change. So what he's talking about is, when, you're, when you get a new requirement, don't just do whatever code that you can write to make that test pass. What you really wanna do is you wanna make the first edit, which is to adjust the program to match the new theory that is just developed in your mind, okay? So restructure your program so that the theory is there, and then it's just like every other requirement that you would, you would patch into the program. So I haven't said exactly what a theory is, but maybe think of it this way. If you deleted your source code repository, you would be able to rebuild that program much faster the second time because you've got these ideas in your head. And by ideas, I don't mean like I remember there used to be a class called Foo, but you have these deeper uh, understandings of what was going on in the problem to me. So the theories include three major parts. First is models of the world, that is the, the problem domain, okay? Second is models of the design or technology, and this is primarily the focus of this conference, is the software architecture, right? The, we believe that uh, these two things are distinct from each other, okay? Um, or as we were, we were chatting over uh, beers the other night, it's like some people think that you can look at the problem really hard and the architecture will emerge. And that has not been my experience. Uh, people for thousands of years were very hot and sweaty in the summertime and at no point did air conditioning and thermodynamics emerge from that, right? That, they, they, were, they were orthogonal dimensions, right? And so uh, when you say I have a, an idea, you might say there are three different standard art, uh, ways of moving heat from inside the building to the outside the building, great. 
I need to choose one of those that's a good fit for the problem at hand, right? And in this particular building, there's like giant boxes on the roof, okay? But in your house, you don't have giant boxes on the roof. You've got something slightly different because it's the appropriate technology choice for the problem. And then finally, you need an argument about why the design does this thing, okay? You would say the big boxes on the roof of, of a hotel make sense because the problem looks like this, right? You, you have an argument about why that works. So here's my big statement. If you remember one thing from this whole talk, it is the following. If that we want to get into these uh, loops by which we get requirements in and we're able to react to them, we're able to redesign the program on the fly, we have to be in a situation where the code itself is expressing our theories, okay? And that the code is that effective partner where I'm, 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 as an individual, looking at it, and I'm able to do this cognitive expansion and work on these really big problems. And that uh, a corollary to this should be that my uh, procedures on my team should be trying to drive my understanding back into the code such that uh, when the next requirement comes in, it's just an incremental step to get to that next requirement, as opposed to like each one gets harder because I haven't uh, done the rework. So I think this series of three slides here is going to be uh, something you're going to resonate with and be straightforward. <coughs> Rube Goldberg machines are not your partner in thought, okay? Uh, a bunch of code that happens to solve a problem because you can stare at it long enough and go, okay, I sort of see what's going on, and we've all done this reverse engineering of code, okay? Like, that is not the way forward, okay? And the thing that's going on here is not just that it's weird, it's that each thing is irreducible in its complexity. It's not getting simpler, okay? It's just like you've just swapped more and more details in your head until at some point you're like, it's harder and harder to understand why this thing is gonna work. And the only people that are effective at working with it are the ones that have spent the most time with it, which is not the kind of thing you wanna reward in your company, okay? Till finally, it's just something that's sort of mind-boggling in its terms of its complexity, right? And again, Left to our own devices, we might build this up because it's not so bad. We're like the boiling frog ourselves. Like, yeah, I built this, and I built that, and I built this. Okay, but this is, this is the anti-pattern of what we want to build. So how do we start chipping away? Well, I'm going to direct your attention to one little bit up here. Say, like, there's this yellow thing that's sort of acting like a spring. So what we need to do is we need to exert intellectual control over individual pieces. We develop theories of how those things work. We introduce shared vocabulary, okay? Say so this is the theory of, of springs, and that starts to help us think more clearly about that problem. Recursively repeat, get this thing under control, and then as time goes forward, you're just making incremental changes to your theory. And I believe this is what's going in, on in other fields where you do see year by year incremental changes, okay? Is that if we look at, say, a domain like car engines, and I understand the reasons why manufacturing is not the same as what we're doing in software design, but if you just focus on the design aspects, they are accumulating a set of theories about how to do engine design and they're incrementally moving them forward every year. They also have the benefit that they're shooting at the same target, short of switching to electric engines, okay? But like, this, is, this is a success case. Like, we should be shooting for that kind of thing, moving forward. I wanna chat with you guys about technical debt. Uh, there are different ways of using this term technical debt. I like to think about it in perhaps what is the original statement of it, which is that I'm writing the best code that I know how to write right this second. I'm not deliberately writing bad code or like I'm gonna trade off this versus that. No, I'm writing the best code, but I might not understand the problem correctly. In which case, the code that I wrote was not a very good expression, or rather it was a lousy theory. So in that sense, you can think of tech debt as actually being theory debt. Right? I wrote the very best program that I knew how to write yesterday, but now I realize I shouldn't have done that, okay? And so the code itself has inertia, and so when Ward Cunningham was talking about tech debt, he was really talking about this inertia of changing the theory that's already embedded inside the code, okay? And then it becomes harder to think about those problems, right? And he actually expressed this in his YCash uh, paper. He said, we, we thought this way about financial instruments, and then once we understood the correct way, in order to work with the code, you had to map from your current abstractions back into the old ones, manipulate the code, and keep going. And he's like, that's like paying down debt on a loan. You need to get rid of that debt in the code. So um, one last point in terms of this convergence is that we should hope and expect 
that our models of the problem domain converge over time as we understand it better and better. I'm not sure that that's always going to happen in the technology side, okay? So should we converge on COBOL, right? Like, no, I mean, like, there's this sort of like other things that happen that move us forward. Um, a friend of mine gave me another example is, um, when you're doing some computational things, uh, depending upon the current environment, that thing might be CPU bound. But like, as Amazon makes different kinds of instances available, well, that's not CPU bound, it's now memory bound, okay? And that's something that was outside of your code. It's not clear that that stuff is fully going to converge. So here's my observation, and, and I don't know if you guys will agree or find the same thing, but uh, over time, as your team develops these theories about the domain, and they become clearer and clearer, the source code in the small takes on a functional or declarative flavor. So here's an example, like if you take a look at that speaker example, like more and more things got declared as like maximum distance or safe distance and set of inter interfering speakers and the way that you figure out whether two things are interfering is, you know, like and there's a little lambda expression, a little function. It sort of feels like regardless of the programming language, that kind of stuff comes out. And I think it represents uh, a more compact understanding than um, how do I understand this? Well, you run my Turing machine. Okay, that's not as compact of an understanding as this style. Okay, last section. How are we doing on time? Just fine? Okay, that's good. You never know. I have like 90 slides in 90 minutes. I'm trying to get through it all. How are you guys doing? Is it okay? All right, okay, good. Last section. So, what do I mean by this continuous design stuff, and why do I call it continuous design? Well, uh, there's a lot of great techniques uh, right now that I would like to use. I've been trying to figure out how to get a bunch of techniques to work together that naturally sort of fight each other. And the best example of fighting each other is this idea of iteration zero, right? Where we sort of, I wanna do architecture and I wanna have control and so I slide it all into iteration zero, but it sort of goes against the intent of I'm gonna jump into this project and I'm not gonna have control at the beginning, but I'm gonna trust in the feedback loops. And so um, what I'd like to be able to do is do design incrementally and continuously, which leads me to this idea that I need to be developing theories. And if we have a big team, and if I wanna use uh, extended cognition myself, those theories need to get into the source code, okay? You guys may come up with other stable places in this giant design space, but this is the one that I've been playing with and I'm trying to understand how those things work. Um, other, there's a lot of people talking right now about blends of agile and architecture. Um, many of them are not leaning on the open loop control the way I think our community does, right? You wanna be able to think through things clearly, you wanna be able to aim the cannon, okay? And in fact, they may argue that you don't want to aim the cannon, and, I, and I, I do not agree with that. At least I haven't seen evidence that was going to convince me. So I think most of those other blends tend to use a kind of closed loop control, and in particular, sometimes they talk about uh, hypotheses that you might have, like a hypothesis that I need to add a cache. I think that's a different kind of thing than the theories I'm talking about. That, that, that hypothesis is, I've gotten to this situation, things are not working quite right, maybe this intervention this incremental intervention is going to work out, as opposed to saying, I have this worldview, right? The worldview includes the architecture and the problem domain and it all fits together and I've aimed the cannon. Uh, and so I think those are different things. So again, looking at the open loop architecture reasoning, um, you wanna avoid this sort of Yagni first draft, I think. I think you wanna shoot as close to the target as you can the first time, and then you're gonna be able to hone in on it very quickly. And then you wanna specifically look for processes that are gonna drive the theory building, okay? If you just hope that it works out, if you hope that the team starts to coordinate, I'm not saying that's bad. Uh, you, you can use closed, or sorry, yeah, closed loop processes to like drive that understanding. But maybe think about it from the beginning about how that is gonna work out. The way that I think about these is that you're constantly tweaking uh, the amount of closed loop control that you're using versus open loop control. Uh, it's not that the closed loop control that like nudges you back on target isn't gonna work. I think it is gonna work. But it starts to, like I said, the, uh, the, 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 the friction that builds up makes it harder and harder to get this clean system that you would like. So you, you, I would lean towards the open loop control where you, where you can get away with it. 
I think you want to actively seek improvements in your theory. This is this lovely quote from Eric Evans' Domain Driven Design where he talks about this epiphany that you have that allows you to reduce a whole bunch of complexity in your code. And you gotta figure out ways to like encourage people to look for those things and to drive them uh, through the code. And you wanna avoid this particular problem, right? Because if it's just a metronome of feature, 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 that's what my backlog beats into me, then you start just building up this snowball of complexity that eventually you give up on because it's too hard to keep making progress with. So instead you say like, I gotta keep refactoring the snowball, uh, driving it down, driving my theories into it. These two different systems, which we're familiar with, this is such an uh, example everyone uses, but like that works. That's the problem. Like that system works, you know? That gets the features out the door. The incremental value, or the incremental value is good, but the incremental effort is very bad. Whereas over here, you're like, ah, oh, the complexity has evaporated. That, that's gonna work much better. And uh, so like when you think about the processes on your team, are they geared towards delivering features or are they geared towards this theory building? And I'm not saying you can do one to the exclusion of the other, but if you don't have a healthy balance between the two, you're really just building the snowball. So here's specifically what I've been doing. These are the last two slides. I've been trying to build up a rich and expressive set of types because the types represent the things that I'm thinking about in a simulation, in a simula sense. Uh, and these types can be operated on simply. Like I've been trying to make methods that are five lines long at most. And if I can make it a one-liner uh, that's well-named, that's what I'm looking for. I'm trying to align the nouns that you would see in my program with the concepts that are in my domain. Uh, and I'm trying to actively drive out synonyms because synonyms, like when stuff is like 80% the same, I'm like, that, that indicates that we don't have a clear theory about this. Like we need to get them lined up 100% or they're two different things. And then, um, and this is where, uh, what I've been doing is a little different, is instead of having like the architecture document, I'm just driving that into comments and in the code and readme files that sit inside there. Anyone's used GitHub these days knows how valuable having those readme files is in there. The, you write them in Markdown, and as you just navigate to a directory, the first thing you see is all the stuff from the readme. And you can embed diagrams inside those things. And they're sitting right next to the code, right? It's like so much more discoverable. Um, if, if it's in there, and it's more likely to be updated. And then you can also say, hey, before you check in your code, could you also update the sequence diagram because you know, it's sitting in the same directory? Oh yeah, 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 ding, ding, three more lines of code, all set. The second thing is that I'm seeking out theories that express uh, what I'm doing, and I'm getting them into the code, and I'm, when code reviews happen, you make sure that the other developer is doing their part, right? Like if it turns out this chunk of code is moving the theory forward an increment, like you know, changing it a little bit, make sure that the, all the other trappings have been updated at the same time. If you don't understand why this code works, sort of like the stoplight, ask for context and ask them to see if they can drive that context back into the code. Use those code reviews to expose and fix the mis mis misunderstandings of the team. Because if, if somebody wrote some code and you go, that violates an architectural assumption or an architectural invariant, guess what? The other person wasn't trying to write bad code, right? So use that as an opportunity to say, here's what's going on. And um, we use a lot of uh, uh, tribal repetition of what's going on. Like, you know, a new person comes on and you're like repeating these things over and over. Um, and you just train the team over time to express what's going on in their head into the code. Like, don't tell me now, don't tell me verbally, put it in the code. Like, even better if the code expresses the idea directly rather than as a comment. And then finally, and this, one is, this one's tricky, uh, is that you're trying to use the stand-up meetings to announce, to broadcast, to alert the other people about the changes to the theory, okay? And this is tough, especially for developers that haven't been doing this for a very long time, uh, that they need to say, remember that old theory? Well, it's giving us trouble over in here. Check back with me in a couple days. Okay, a couple days later in stand-up they go, okay, we figured it out. It works like this now, so don't be surprised when you see this in the code. So um, in the last talk, uh, Joe Yoder had a, a, a pattern map, okay, a graph of his pattern language. I was like, I need one of those too. So this was obviously produced between <laughs> in the last hour. Um, so it must be perfect. So central to this idea is that you've got code that's expressing your theories, okay? And then other things are surrounding it in these sort of other cycles and phenomena, okay? So the top one is a bit simpler. You know, the code expresses the theories. Uh, everyone on the team reads the code and therefore gets the theories in their head, 
okay? And that's not the only mechanism, but let's say it's a big mechanism. Okay, they decide they need to evolve the theory. They use the stand-up meetings to say, hey, something is coming, or like, let's chat about this. If you've got ideas, let's chat. Um, they refactor the code to match the theory, okay? And then boom, now your code's expressing your theories again, okay? The two have gotten lined up. But there's also sort of like the, the problem loop, which is that you read the code and you find out that it's actually hard to figure out what's going on. And this is the loop by which you're not changing the theory, you're just aligning, you're, you're, you're making the code more compact and more expressive uh, and a better representation. It's like going from an essay that you wrote as your first draft to the essay you wrote as your final draft, right? Where the, the essay is far more effective even though it's saying the same stuff. So that's, that's my idea of sort of like how these things are fitting together. So overall, this talk was about uh, investigating the idea that we uh, use the source code as a central place uh, by which we organize our activities and express much of our intent. Um, it it uh, did in sort of a, like a literary deconstruction idea, said here's five different topics that I think it's worth paying attention to. Uh, I wish I had those on the screen right now, but maybe you guys remember. Uh, one of them was the internal and external alignment. There was the control loops. There was intellectual control. There was team roles. And then the other one. Does anybody remember the other one? Sorry? All right, all right. So, so we've got these things, and the, uh, the part that's interesting for me is how we can preserve the things that we hold most dear as the software architecture community. I mean, not for the, I'm not saying preserve them just because we thought of them yesterday and let's not throw it away, but I'm saying I don't want to lose the value that we've gotten in the software architecture community, that we come up with a series of abstractions, that we can think through these things, and that gives us leverage over the program. That's incredibly valuable, okay? We've got a pattern catalog. We've got standard abstractions for thinking about things from module, runtime, and allocation views. Like, these are incredibly durable and useful abstractions. I hate to think that if I say, I would like to have uh, closed loop control and like pick up requirements every day, I have to lose all that architecture stuff that I found so valuable. So I'm, I'm highly motivated to figure out how we can effectively merge these things together and make them work out. Uh, so that's, that's the sort of stuff I'm working on. And uh, thanks for your attention today, and it's been a, a pleasure, and um, let's chat. We've got questions. Is there a microphone for the question? Uh, there we go. Okay. Hi. Um, I like the way you depicted kind of early on the caricature of the architect versus the agilist. And I guess you could say I, I find myself in that debate um, several times, you know, depending on which team I'm working on and things. Um, do you have any suggestions on, from an, um, an architecture role, if we have teams that are very much towards that agilist role, like how do you work through that conversation, if you will, um, maybe to give a little on each side? Yeah. Um, so, so one of the problems here is the language, right? So the, the agile manifesto says, hey, I think that we're not being reactive enough, okay? Uh, but, but other than that, it's very difficult to precisely characterize uh, the group of people that you may be speaking with, right? So here's one of the concerns I have, is that th there's a bunch of people who initiated ideas and are, are thought leaders in that community, uh, and they speak very coherently, and in fact, I think they're, they're aware of and respect the work that we do, for example, in the design and architecture community, okay? But there's a second level of people that parrot those things, parrot those things, and, and they could be the people inside your company that, that have like read a book and they become true believers and carriers of the flag, uh, but they're not ready to make the same trade-offs, or they may not understand the history, or they may not uh, appreciate the value of other, uh, like for example, what comes from our community if you do it well. So the, your question was something like, how do we work with these people, okay? Um, one answer is obviously education. Like over time, slowly, we're saying like there's good stuff to be done. Uh, uh, there, there's, there's things you should be aware of before we engage in this conversation. Uh, it reminds me there's a, uh, uh, 
a blog post on the internet that says, like, if you're about to debate strong typing or you know, static typing and dynamic typing, please be aware of this stuff first, okay? And uh, it sort of sets the stage, and I think it usually diffuses the argument simply by setting the stage. It's like, it's not, this is good, that's bad. It's, you know, there's, there's trade-offs between the two. So what I've been trying to do with this work is trying to figure out how, how we can turn it into not a conflict, right? Is that I want to be agile. Like, I want to use the feedback loops. I don't want to use them to the exclusion of the, uh, the, the open loop control, though. If I sufficiently hedged on that question? Okay. Okay, do we have more questions? Okay. I'm wondering if you could give more detail about the the theory debt, because you had mentioned an example where you wanted to rename, because we basically kept along a name that started and we realized the theory changed and it's a different yep. model altogether. Yep. I, I think in, in theory, to, to use the word again, like it makes a lot of sense to do that, but in practice, it's a, it may be like a large cost to actually yep. change it. Yeah, well, so thank you. I think that that was a great summary of what I was trying to shoot for, which is if, when you write the code in the first place, you were 90% right, you're just tweaking it and getting it to like the last little bit, okay? Tweaking, I'm overloading that word, but you know what I'm trying to say. You're making small adjustments to it. If you really just uh, start out pretending you don't know anything about the problem and you use fully the cruise missile approach to get you back on track, uh, I found that you end up with uh, names that don't work out right or locations for code that don't work out right that become so difficult to change, it's hard for you to make a cost-benefit analysis. It's like, yeah, we, all right, here, here's a simple example. Like, you see this in the code, and say, like, there's three subdirectories under one of them, but two of them are this kind of thing, and one of them is that kind of thing, but, you know, like, uh, it's like, they, 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 you want to use the directory structure to line up to, say, a, a line with a certain category of stuff. Uh, the, Ward Cunningham's original paper uh, on, from the YCash portfolio is very good on technical debt. And he, there's another one where it's a short five minute video and there's a transcription uh, of his on the, the C2 wiki. And he's explaining what he meant by all this stuff. And there's a particular phrase in there that I like where he says something along the lines of, we wanted to make, uh, when we were all done uh, by incorporating in the new changes, we wanted to make it look like we knew what we were doing all along and that it was easy to do in small talk, okay? And I'm just like, yeah, I mean, that's the code you want. I mean, when you go back into the code the second time, you wanna be in a situation where you're like, all that is settled, I'm not coming into this and having to solve yesterday's problems before I solve today's problems. Uh, and when I think about what that means, I think what that means is that I've, I've done some amount of mental integration of the theories to say like, these theories weren't explaining the problem very well. And then secondly, that I've, I've incorporated those theories into the code, such the, tho the code to the extent possible in the programming language is expressing that, that idea I had in my head. And so tech debt is the gap, right? And unfortunately, that means, if you, if you take this definition, tech debt happens as soon as I have a change in my head, right? It's not when the code does something wrong or starts exhibiting bugs or something, it's when I go, oh, that was boneheaded, or oh, I could do that with five concepts instead of eight. Right? It, you, you, once you realize that it's smaller and more compact and it's in your head, well then now you're using this external representation that's not the effective way for you to think about the problem. Uh-oh. Linda has a question. If you talked about this when I was at the talk of your competitors, forgive me. So I'm a little bold in asking you mean a Michael question. Keeling? <laughs> yeah. No, Owen Keeling. <laughs> Owen, yeah. Owen Michael and Owen Keeling. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So the closed loop people, the agile list of people, okay. Yeah. Um, what was lost in, in what everybody came to worship and adore in that approach was what Kent Beck called the metaphor, mm. which he never really explained. Yeah. But in my mind, a metaphor is very close to what you're calling a theory. In Kent Beck's world, the metaphor was really well understood because he did all of this stuff in yep. the same kind of system for which the, quote, architecture was very well known. Right. Am I missing the boat? 
Is that kind of what you're trying to marry? I always thought that if people went off on the rules, he didn't explain the metaphor very well because Agreed. it was tough. And people just left that part. And But I think we're getting back to it with this. OK, is that yeah. close? Uh, it is close. Um, in one of the sections here, I talked about the, uh, the theories having uh, three parts. Uh, okay, so two, I missed that part. At least two are relevant. Um, the, 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 the part that's not relevant is, in an ideal world, if I read the code, I would understand, let's, let's just say it was architecture and, uh, let's say it's a three-tier architecture that I'm going to use for an accounting system, right? Mm -hmm. There should be some argument in the code that says why the three-tier architecture is the suitable thing for this, right? right. Or like, right. if this module shouldn't depend on that module, there should be some argument about I should be able to infer in some way why that's the case. Okay, we know that's really hard, but like that's the goal. Right. Okay, and uh, so of the theory, uh, the three parts are: you've got a theory about the problem domain, which might be accounting mm -hmm. and debits mm -hmm. and credits and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Okay, that language should appear in my program. I don't think that's what Kent's talking about when he talks about the metaphor. Right? No. No. I think he was talking about this other thing, which is a hinting way of talking about architecture and design yes, patterns. Yes, yes, yes. And I would still say, though, that if you think back 20 years ago, 25 years ago, probably was when he was, when this stuff was formed, it was like mid-90s, right? You're still talking about small talk programs that they were, they were single node. They were literally serialized images. Uh, they weren't, they didn't have modularity except for the object, okay? And I oftentimes refer to that as a, a sea of objects, okay? Mm -hmm. And it's hard for anybody these days who hasn't programmed in Smalltalk to really get that in your head. Okay, so it wasn't that you say ran myprogram.exe. What you did was you made changes to the instances of these objects were sitting in memory. And when you were done for the day, you hit save, and all of your runtime objects in memory with all their pointers and all their methods on them got serialized down into a big blob on the disk. Okay, and when you came in the next day or you deployed a program to a customer site. What you did was deserialize that blob back into memory. Like I know, just like get your head around that. Okay, so like none of that is like what software architecture became, which was like these principled ways of structuring the software either within that blob or across different blobs. Now, I'm not trying to say the small talk community was categorically ignorant of that stuff. I'm just saying it was not a forefront kind of well structured way. Like if you think about the way we now understand modularity, both. Uh, module and runtime modularity. Like that stuff wasn't present in the small talk community that I was part of in the 90s. Well, the small talk community grew out of the Simula community, and the Simula community was the domain model people. I mean, that was the whole genesis. I have two other, can I? Two other quick questions. One is, whose picture was next to the Kent Beck quote? Because that sure wasn't Kent Beck. Sorry? Yeah, who was oh, that? Oh, that was Richard Stallman. Oh, okay. That was Richard, right. I, I, I was like, who, who should be on the programming slide but Richard Stallman? And then oh, later, okay. later okay, on, but then, then you put later the Kent, on, quote, the Kent Beck thought. quote managed to make its way onto there because it seemed to make sense. But it was, I wasn't trying to imply that was Kent Beck. Okay. Way too much hair. I, I was going to say, I, you know. And, okay. <laughs> Kent Beck's it, uh, arrest picture. Everyone yeah, has the, exactly. the arrest <laughs> picture where they're looking wild. His mug, his <laughs> Bill shot, Gates. Like, shot with a wig. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the Rube Goldberg picture that you had brilliant picture of legacy systems with all of these little repairs. What made you pick the orange spring in the corner? Uh, because I knew how to characterize springs <laughs> and I was trying to evoke something that like it was aspirational in terms of we're probably not going to hit uh, an equation on this stuff but it had language and an equation and, and that's where we represented the gold so, standard. So, but that would be the tough thing. Yeah. If you have a legacy yeah. system that has all of this, right. how would you go to that? And, and you just gave some criteria, but how right. could you distill that criteria into a way to map into that quagmire? Uh, as I wrote in my recent IEEE software article called Intellectual Control that made it to the front page of Hacker News, um, thank you, EPEC, for inviting me to, to write that article. Um, so, so my experience with trying to get intellectual control over a large system, which I've tried to do a couple different times, um, is that uh, my, my initial temptation is to start in the code that I'm writing, okay? And then the problem is then that tries to expand out in the, the code that's right next to me. And then I just irritate my coworkers because I'm asking for a higher standard of uh, structure to the code uh, that they, they're not ready for, and then they fight me because 
they, they think I'm doing stuff that's wrong or gold plated or something, something, okay? So by that I mean, do the methods have clear contracts? When they talk about the language, are we avoiding synonyms? And have we actually got these concepts straight? And have we got encapsulation on things? So my temptation is always that it just keeps creeping into the systems around me. So what I've been doing recently with better success is find the absolute bottom of the system, like where there's no more dependencies or it jumps off into infrastructure, and start working up from the bottom and saying like, you're about to go get something off of the disk. Go find the customer. Well, what does it do when you don't find the customer? Is that well understood? Is that well communicated to the caller, okay? Does it throw an exception? Does it return null? Does it return optional? Does it return what, okay? All those kinds of things, okay? And then you just work that way up the system, then that seems to work out. And then you start having success examples for other people because getting back to, there's a technical problem to solve and there's a social problem of bringing everybody else along with you. Uh, and even if you do have uh, absolute powers to tell people do the following things, it's much easier when you're convincing them and showing them like, I'm in here with you, I'm in here bailing out the boat and we're like working our way up and we'll get there. So I don't know, does that answer your question? Like how did I choose it? Well, I would say choose it at the bottom, uh, even though that picture had it at the top because it, there was a springy thing. But yeah, choose the things that have as few dependencies as possible. That way you can actually exert control over that code. And you say, like, that is my gold standard. That's the kind of code I want to be writing. And that's the code I will write next, one level up, right? Yeah. Hmm. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.